You're watching VA TV, bringing Brookline home. I'm Steve Bressler. Welcome to the Safety Net. I'm here along with Susan Howards. And today we are going to do the third in our series in the relationship between domestic violence and pet abuse. And joining Susan and myself today are uh, the Honorable Martha Grace, who is a retired Chief Justice of the Massachusetts Juvenile Court. Welcome. Thank you. Dr. Terry Bright, who is the Director of Behavior and Training at the MSPCA Angel Memorial Hospital. Welcome. Thank you. And our old standby, Dr. Lloyd Jeleno, who is the Human Relations and Human Services Administrator with the Brookline Health Department. Good Welcome, you. Lloyd. Good to see you, you again. It's been a while since we did our last show. This is, as I said, our third in the mm -hmm. series on uh, the relationship between domestic violence and pet abuse. And this is something that has concerned Susan especially ever since she got her pet, her dog. And I met Dr. Bright immediately <laughs> met because Dr. I couldn't handle my internet rescue pet. I went quick and next thing you know. At any rate, I think it would be interesting to know how a juvenile court chief justice is involved with pet abuse and violence. How did you get involved in this? Um, I was always interested in animals, but um, I was a judge for 20 years, and I, we have um, mandatory retirement in Massachusetts. So I retired in 2009, and I went to Tufts Veterinary School to get a master's degree in animals and public policy. I knew that I would learn about farm animals and wildlife. I was unprepared for the fact that I was introduced to a topic called the links between animal abuse and human violence specifically domestic violence and child abuse. And I was dumbfounded. I couldn't imagine that I had been a ju judge for 20 years and I had never heard about these connections. There's an enormous amount of work being done on the topic, but the people doing the work didn't always talk to the decision makers, the judges and the lawyers and the prosecutors and the social workers and the therapists and the teachers and the police. So we have a lot of work to do. And I decided that that's what I was going to do, use my efforts that way. Wow. Wow, that's quite a leap, quite a leap. Terry, how did you get involved? I got involved through meeting you all, and I do not deal directly with abuse cases at the MSPCA Angel. I deal with them indirectly, so one of the things I do is help evaluate dogs for rehoming, um, see how they've, if a dog has been potentially abused, then we call in our law enforcement department and they investigate many, many cases of abuse every year. Part of my job is to see if that animal can be rehomed, rehabilitated in any way. Um, so we, we see some, some sad cases and people might see cases in their neighborhood if they have questions about abuse or they want to talk to somebody about something they've seen that they want to know. It's whether it's abuse or not, they can call MSPCA Angel at 617-522-6008. Are there signs of pet abuse that we should all know? It's kind of hard to say signs of abuse. Certainly, um, it's physical signs, like if you see an animal that you know has cigarette burns on it or, or is, is repeatedly wounded, you know, if you're a vet or work at a vet or, um, and you see an animal that, you know, we had a puppy that had been seen for multiple broken bones, just more than any puppy could ever bear, you know, um, and so we did investigate a case like that. But sometimes a dog might look like they've been abused, but they're just under-socialized. They're very fearful because they didn't meet enough people when they were in their critical period of puppyhood, when they learn that people are friendly. So it's kind of hard to tell. It's kind of hard to tell. What are some of the links, Judge, between pet abuse and domestic violence? 
um, I think people don't realize, if you talk to women in shelters, uh, domestic violence shelters, they will often tell you that they would have left much sooner, but for the fact that they were fearful that the batterer would harm their pet. And it's a very real fear because women often are um, emotionally and psychologically tied to their animals. There are these tremendous bonds. Um, and so the, so the people are afraid to leave because they're afraid to have the pet harmed. Women who go to shelters, that's a confidential uh, address. But women who leave the home and go to their parents' house, or their mother's house, or their sister's house, or a friend's house, we've had stories about uh, an animal being delivered to the house without an ear, or a body of an animal, or horrible things that the batterer has done, because the batterer uses that as a means of control, intimidation, coercion. Um, all of the things that they do to batter the, 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 the spouse um, are equally applied to animals. There's one interesting aspect to this, and that's that children in a household are often told never to tell social workers anything that happens in a house between the, the batter or the, the two people who are fighting. Um, and so that when someone interviews the child and says, do your parents fight, do they ever hit each other, um, the child will say no. If you ask that child about an animal, no one's ever told them not to say anything about animals. And so the interviewers often find out a great deal about what's going on in the home when they're told through the lens of the animal. It's huh. very interesting. It but actually resonates with me because actually when I used to do clinical practice and go in, into people's homes, it's one of the questions we would ask. Um, it's more about the animal rather than what's going on because we know the kids would probably respond to that. So. I know that some of your clients bring their pets in with them. Do you ever, do you ever see any signs of uh, animal abuse or do, the, do clients ever talk about how, how they're taking out their frustrations or whatever on the animals? Um, no, uh, I'm going to say that currently no, but in the past I've seen that. In fact, I've actually watched a client actually kick their dog um, in a session. They bring the, um, so you see it. And, um, and those cases are typically associated with some kind of domestic violence. Uh, n and not necessarily the, the person coming to therapy is the perpetrator. Um, it's someone else in the household that's doing it. So it's sort of down, they get kicked and they kick the dog. I've seen that uh, pit bulls and, and uh, th those types of, of breeds are the recipients of the most frequently of, of abuse. Is there anything? That's breed pro profiling, and oh, you could probably, I'm guessing, you could take any dog and make it vicious really? and violent. But I don't think dogs per se, unless they're bred, inbred for that purpose, are, are vicious. I think you have to train them. So. I, were you, did you mean dogs were the victims? More, yeah. more, more, I mean, they're a very popular dog in the city, so in an urban area, the, the possibility that a dog that's abused is going to be a pit bull is higher just because there's more pit bulls than there are Labrador retrievers, for example. Um, but they're not more necessarily abused just because they're pit bulls, but just because they're the animal that's in the home. Are there other types of animals other than dogs? That are cats. Abused? That ever abuse cats? Cats. Almost, almost any animal can be. If you, if you were on a farm, then horses and um, cattle, and there are all kinds of animals that can theor theoretically be abused, and neglect is one of the things that often happens. So, um, so a neighbor might call up the police and say, I see a dog out in the backyard, or in, in the case of a farm, a horse, and, and there's no water, there's no food, there's no, there's no shelter, and then the police come, and maybe the, the neighbor is wrong. Maybe they just can't see on the other side of the fence where mm -hmm. there is water and shelter, but often, um, Often there are uh, situations in which the, the reporting of that is, uh, is useful and the police do respond and they call animal control. And the animal control officers are um, singularly trained in the way to do this. Um, there is a case that is going to be heard by our state Supreme Judicial Court um, in a couple of weeks. Is that the Quincy one? No, that's a case uh, called Commonwealth versus Heather Duncan. It hasn't been heard yet, and it's about whether the police or animal control or anybody has the right to go on property to get a dying dog or a case of emergency uh, without a warrant. 
It's that the idea of a warrantless search for an animal has never been heard. It's a case of first impression. What about public exigency? It's only been applied to people. How interesting. Yes, so How keep your eye on that. Keep well, should, should, should judges be able to give warrants out uh, at a moment's notice if, if uh, an animal control officer feels that there's a need to go into a home, onto private property? Well, in, in this case, I, I assume the argument is uh, there wasn't time to go get a warrant because the dogs were dying. Someone had reported two dead dogs in the yard and several dying dogs. Mm -hmm. So it, there, was a, there was a decision that there was no time to get a warrant. Now challenged, it'll be interesting to see what our state Supreme Court does. But if there were time, do you think judges should be? I do. I do because I, I don't think that we make a I don't think we should be making distinctions if there is a, an animal that's been harmed or abused or mm -hmm. in, in mm -hmm. extremists that we should, that some, they ought to be able to be helped. Would it, would it have to be a judge? Could it be a clerk of court? Um, well, the clerk of courts typically, the clerks would, would be the ones who would be giving the warrants. Mm -hmm. I don't know what they would do. And so people are going to be watching this case carefully mm -hmm. to see what the role of animals will be in this society. Judge, you mentioned that DCF has a, an interest in um, the link between domestic violence and pet abuse. And are they, I'm going to ask the question straight out, are they trained? Not yet, but we're doing it. Okay. And for uh, our viewers who don't know what DCF is. It's okay. Division of the Department of Children and Families. That's the Child Protective Service in the state. And they go in to determine um, whether a child is safe in the home and whether the child should be removed. And if they think it should be removed, they come to court. One of the things that we do when we train DCF workers, we're training groups. We, we've done three or four groups around the country mm -hmm. and around the state, rather, and, and we hope to do more. One of the things we tell them is um, take a look at what's happening with the pets in the house because, and you might ask the children, we pass out a questionnaire that lets them ask about questions about the animals in the house. Um, if you see an animal that's 14 or 15 years old, that's probably a good sign. But sometimes children tell you, oh, every time my dog does something, or I get a dog and it does something wrong, or it wets on the carpet, we don't see it after that. And these are the kinds of things we're trying to get social workers to pay attention to. As, as far as I know, they do not yet or do not now have training when they get when they become social workers in pet issues in the home. But our research tells us that it is critical to understand what's happening between animals and mm -hmm. and I would say that in a good percentage of the cases that uh, the division of Department of Children and Families handles, there is domestic violence and mm -hmm. I mean mm -hmm. there's addiction, domestic violence. Every case, almost every case that I had as a judge involved one of these, uh, either domestic violence or some sort of addiction. Susan, in your, in your practice, in your experience, have, have you encountered violence against pets? I have to be honest. I never really thought about it until about two years ago, until I became interested in this subject. But um, I would think that if there's violence against humans, there's certainly violence. I'm, I'm going to say that there's violence against uh, pets, yes. I do know that the restraining order that now includes pets is a huge step, but I'm not sure that judges know how to use it or are willing to use it or are willing to get involved in that aspect. They're willing to, yes, you can't go back to the house, yes, you have to go blah, 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 but I don't think they're willing to go any farther. They seem to be shifting things to the probate court, at least in the criminal courts. And I try to keep my cases in criminal court because it's a little more clout over the um, batterer, but as a defense attorney, I also defend batterers. So now I'm asking, do you have any pets? What's your relationship with the pet? And you can tell when the client is reluctant to tell you about the relationship mm. with the pet. So I, sa I say, I guess I can assume that the pet is not 100%. I don't know how else to say it as right. their attorney, mm -hmm. but basically that you're abusing the pets. And did you ever think that maybe you could go to Angel or, or take the pet someplace? I mean, where? Where is the answer for this for the pets? Because let's say the woman and the children go to the shelter and the pet's left at home. What do they do? Do they call animal control? Do they call the Brookline police and will they come and get them? I don't think they will. I don't think so. There's a group called HAVEN, H-A-V-E-N, in Berkshire County, which stands for Human Animal Violence Education Network. And they are a coalition of police, animal control, veterinarians, 
And what, that's exactly what happens when the police are called to a home to issue a uh, restraining order. They will call Animal Control, who will call a veterinarian, who will call foster homes for pets. And they have it all set up in that area to take care of people who need to leave the home but don't want to leave the pets behind. The issue of the pets and restraining order is something that lots of people, including me, worked very hard to get passed. And it was passed in October 2012 that a judge could add pets to restraining orders. The confusion, and I hear a lot of it when we go out and speak to groups, is uh, sometimes people will say, well, the judge didn't or refused to add the pet to the restraining order. And what I try to tell them is this allows the judge to add the pets to the restraining order. It's not mandated that they do. The difference is that when a plaintiff asks the children to be added to the restraining order, no one questions that because no one has to prove that the children are, are harmed. Everybody knows the children have to go with somebody, so they might as well go with the, with the, um, with the woman who's the, usually the woman, the plaintiff. When, they, when it comes to pets, um, the, the jury's out yet. We're not really sure whether the person seeking the order has to prove or demonstrate that there is going to be harm to the pet. So I've advised people to say, um, if, you, if your client wants custody of the pet, they should, they should tell the judge what threats have been made, what actions have been made mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. past, so that the woman can bring, or the plaintiff can bring that um, information to the judge's attention. Not, I guess not all violence and, and not all pet abuse is committed by adults. What about children? Uh, abusing pets. Do you see that, Lloyd? We've seen that on a couple of occasions, and usually there's um, some mental health issues. Um, but it's not so distant from if a kid's doing that kind of abuse in, uh, to an animal, that kid's being abused in some way, too. Um, um, so the kid is, it's, so for instance, instead of uh, taking a doll, a teddy bear or something, hitting the teddy bear goes after the, uh, mm -hmm. the dog or the mm -hmm. cat. Mm -hmm. I've seen situations where siblings actually um, one kid owns the pet, and there's a sibling who, for whatever reason, is abusive to the kid and also abuses the dog as well. So it you know, holds, uh, holds a lot of different constellations. Um, one thing that, Terry, I, I don't know if you mentioned, but there's also, in terms of detecting if there's an animal being abused, there's self-abuse too. Um, the dog actually bites himself, pulls out their hair, or an an all the animals do that as well. Um, and I, again, you can't attribute that to domestic violence, but again, going, as a clinician going into someone's home, it's something that you look at, and it's one of those signals that you put in the back of your head to investigate further. Well, something that you always want to see um, in a case like this where you're trying to evaluate if someone is going to be a good guardian for a pet or keep the pet or not is let's see the vet records. So if they have a 15-year-old dog that hasn't seen a vet in five years or no one's clipping the dog's nails or or taking, you know, taking care of the cat's needs in the litter box and thing. Um, I think that's a really important thing to, to see that there is a link, as you mentioned, between abuse and neglect. Neglect can be some of the basest form of abuse and sometimes it's the hardest thing to see an animal who, who has medical problems that have, have been completely mm -hmm. ignored and is suffering because of it, you know, when a simple vet treatment could help them. So that's a really critical piece of all this. You know, I see what you were talking about and what you were talking about now that I go to dog parks. I never even knew a dog park existed until two years ago. I see kids walking around and just whacking a stray, a strange dog because the off-leash parks are fabulous for the dogs to mm -hmm. run around and much cheaper than daycare, which my dog goes to every day. But um, I see them walking dogs and I don't know what to do about it. I'm afraid to get involved. Dogs viciously attacking other dogs when they're on leash and the, the on leash, the, the leash owner just walks away and does nothing. I'm absolutely horrified. So I'm wondering how these people respond within the family. Well, the same way that you see them responding in, in mm -hmm. the park. And, you know, when, when a child sees his mom being beaten up or his sister being beaten up or his brother and the dog, they don't make a distinction between the, the brother and the sister and the parent. They're next, and they watch the abuse and witnessing the abuse, whether it's of a human or an animal, doesn't um, di is not differentiated in many cases by the children. So they imitate that, and they and they may not see it as anything wrong. But as a bystander, 
what would you do? I won't get involved. I'll be honest. I will, n I will call 911 or our number, but I will not get involved between a dog and somebody. Um, I won't get in between the dog and whoever the perpetrator is. I, that's probably wise because you don't know who they are and whether they're going to be violent towards you. Exactly. But if, but if there was a way of identifying the person or where they lived, and you could you could report that, you could report that to the MSPCA. Certainly. And if there are families who are have to go to a shelter and they have a dog, can they bring them to Angel? They no. they can, but they have to surrender it. Right. It becomes our dog right. forever. Know, yeah. Yes. Yeah. We oh. can't. We they could board a dog there if the dog was a client, but we can't just keep someone's dog for a while because we're an open min admission shelter. That means that we have to take in every animal to the tune of seven thousand animals a year that comes in th in the door. So we can't just hold people's animals for them while they find another place to live. So we're we're a place of last resort, and we do get animals that people are are an extremist in some way and they just have no choice but to surrender. If you went to the national www.nationallinkcoalition.org you would see that there are some there's a one company in particular Red Rover which is giving grants to shelters to build kennel um, facilities in the women in the domestic violence shelters. Mm -hmm. I don't think, I don't know if that's we have fabulous. any around here in Massachusetts, but um, this is a national organization and there's, that's happening. And so some domestic violence shelters are building, are building kennel facilities. Um, others are making arrangements so that they're developing what I mentioned is happening in Western Mass, these uh, f developing foster, foster care homes, just like foster homes for children. And of course, there were, there were restrictions and and so you would tell a domestic violence customer or a client to make sure if you want to bring your pet someplace that you have everything that's up to date, all the, all the medical mm -hmm. records, everything. Because if I was going to be a foster parent for a, for a pet, I'd want to know that that pet was up to date with all its fit shots and so forth, anything we should know. You know I'm just thinking about the difficulty that shelters and, and organizations that deal with domestic violence have raising money to do what they do before pets yes. come into the picture. I, and it's not just building a kennel, it's someone who knows how to take care of the animals, uh, who's familiar with the animals, who's not afraid of the animals, who can work with the animals, in addition to working with the, uh, the, the survivors. Wow. And vets, they would have to have some relationship with oh, a yes, vet or with, or with Angel. Um, I, think, um, I think now we're trying to um, introduce a bill that would make man uh, vets mandated reporters like 51A reporters as children. I mean, I, and for children, I don't know that this will happen immediately, but um, I think it's going to happen. Many states have it. Some states have cross-reporting. That's the child protective agencies reporting child abuse and animal abuse, and the animal protective agencies reporting child abuse and animal abuse. Um, but we're not there yet. Um, when we spoke to the vets at Tufts, uh, we said to them, you know, and they were very resistant at the beginning, but now they're, as, they, as they're further along in their, in their careers as vets, they are, um, they're, more, they're more receptive to it. And what I said to them is, if you, as a, as a small animal vet, had, for instance, had three cases, four cases of, animal, of abuse a year, that would be a lot. I'm betting if they were investigated, at least three out of the four would involve some sort of fam familial abuse, child abuse or spousal abuse. And any door that gets, any good door that's able to be opened into a house where there's abuse is a good thing. What for, penalties are there for animal abuse? There are, there are laws. I, I don't know the exact uh, amount now, but there, I mean, the pro prosecution is another whole, prosecution of animal cruelty cases is another whole topic, not for this segment, but um, prosecuting animal abuse cases is something that can be done if the district attorneys in the areas want to do it, and if it's serious well, enough. Norfolk County certainly does with North, this. There, there are three or four uh, county D DA's offices where that it's a, it's a very well-developed animal prosecution um, mm -hmm. part of their departments. But, but that's the, you have an animal control unit. You have a legal Unit, we don't angel. have an animal control unit. We have a law enforcement a law department. Enforcement. Right. And yeah, so we have officers who will go out and investigate and see whether there was abuse happening, if neglect is happening, 
Um, for example, if, if your neighbor leaves their dog outside all the time, that's not against the law. Now, if it's 20 below and the dog's outside all the time, that's mm -hmm. different. But the officers are trained to, to discern and to help the, the pet owner. I mean, their goal is not to yank ah, animals right. out of their homes. Their goal is to help the pet owner. Why, why are you in trouble? Why is your animal in trouble? How can we help you? Do you need a dog house? Do you need what? You know, how, they want to keep that animal in its home and just have its care be improved. That's always our goal. Mm -hmm. They do a great job in educating. They, their, their first goal is not, so they're not interested primarily in prosecution. No. They're interested in educating the owner as to what they could do. And they're a very friendly it. bunch. Yeah, nice. Not as punitive as one would imagine. I'm wondering if it be more punitive given what's going on and the relationship between domestic violence, if maybe there was a little bit of fear. Um, not that it stops domestic violence, but if they were aware of the fact that, you know, if you carry it this far, there are, there are going to be penalties. I think if the courts begin to take it seriously with the restraining orders, um, I think that will be a big step. And regardless of, of what people say, restraining orders, for the most part, do work, even yes. if it's temporarily. They work. And people are frightened of them. Mm. And they take them seriously. So I'm just hoping that the, that's the judge judges will. Well, I think we'll get there. This is Remember, this is relatively new. And, and the society still has sort of a schizophrenic view towards animals. I mean, we, we eat them, we, we wear them for clothes, we use them for experimentation. Mm -hmm. I mean, so that not everybody feels the same way. We don't do that with children. So that there's, there's kind of a, like a schizophrenia about mm -hmm. our They're view towards animals. Chattel. They're yes, still chattel. They're property. Mm -hmm. That's right. But it's um, amazing to see a dog come in in a dress or, you know, they're, mm. it's very hard for us to deal with them as animals. They're, I mean, four million people are bitten by dogs every year, but dogs are animals and that's what they do. They get in trouble and that's one reason if someone has a, a pet and they think that they're going to lose their home or they're going to have to move, I mean, I've just got to make a pitch for train your dog. Make sure your dog is friendly to other people. Just imagine depositing your dog into a stranger's home. How would your dog um, adapt to that? You know, are they are they able to go mm -hmm. lots of different places? I mean, you have to prepare for your for your pet if you're going to be moving around or have an emergency of any kind. I just have to say that every dog needs to be trained and taken That's care of in that way. Point. You know. And even if there's a disaster, could you go to a shelter? I couldn't. I mean, we've talked about that. I could not go. There's no way with all the training. There's an overlay of training, but there's still a reversion back to a nasty little dog. Well, they did learn a lot, though, from Katrina, Hurricane Katrina, when the, when the sure. first responders went and people said, I'm not going without my pets. And they said, well, we have no place for pets. And now the disaster relief teams have places for pets. They have safe, mm -hmm. they have identified safe homes and places where pe people can go. So we learned something from the disasters. We're coming down to the, okay. uh, to the close of the show. So time for last words. Uh, Lloyd, let's start with you. Well, I just want to uh, sort of talk a little bit with Susan to talk about probably more accountability. Um, but uh, at the beginning, the, um, meaning that the people who sell these animals or provide these animals, I think training needs to help uh, start there too. Mm -hmm. And I know we license dogs, but maybe to be a pet owner, we need to be licensed pet owners as well. And so, great point. Yep. Terry? Again, if you see something, say something. The phone number at MSPCA Law Enforcement is 617 522 6008. You can call and anonymously say that you've seen something you think is abuse, and we'll investigate. Judge? Um, I'm delighted for the opportunity to be able to reach yet another audience about this because I think it's an important topic we haven't paid enough attention to. You know, it's, it's amazing, Susan, because when, we, when Susan first said, let's talk about this for the show, I, I couldn't believe we would have enough material for one show. And now we're finishing up our, our third show on, on this topic. It's, it's amazing and to we've me. We've only and just begun. We've only just begun. Well, we are at the end of our show. So I, what I do want to thank you, Lloyd, uh, for being on the show again, Terry, 
Judge Martha Grace. Thank you. Susan, looking forward to doing our next show, which is not going to be on animals, <laughs> by the way. Thank you so much. Thank for you for having us. Yes, I yeah. really appreciate it. I want to thank you, the viewers, for watching The Safety Net. Until next time, I'm Steve Bressler with Susan Howards. Take care.